to the Akeda Project. We invite you to join. One story, many angles. Come learn with us. Let's talk about Genesis 22, in which Abraham nearly sacrifices his son Isaac. I, and I'm going to assume that this is such a well-known story that I don't need to read it or even review it very much, but basically just, you know, the facts that, that, that uh, uh, Abraham is uh, asked or commanded, depending on your point of view, or your, your sense of the Hebrew word na in that uh, wording there, that he's, uh, he's supposed to take his son to sacrifice him, and he goes to a place with uh, his son and two servant boys and an ass, and he sees the place from a distance, and he says to the boys, um, you stay, sit here with the ass, and I and the boy will go over there and prostrate ourselves, which for some reason in English is always translated as, and we will worship, which is not what mishtachavah means in Hebrew. It means always. It means they're going to prostrate themselves. But in fact, that's not true, because only Isaac is going to end up prostrate. Abraham, you know, he's just doing what he's doing. And... Um, he says, we'll go there and we will return to you, he says to the boys. And they're, whoa, why is he saying, and we will return to you? Is, is he lying? Is he deeply hoping and praying that it'll work out that, he, that he'll be able to come back with Isaac? Is it that he's deliberately lying about it so he won't scare Isaac? Uh, we don't know. That's, that's Torah for you. But it'll, it'll work out. And uh, then they go up and... Uh, Isaac uh, says to him, uh, Isaac, not being a stupid child, says, uh, here's, here's, here's uh, the, uh, the fire and here's the wood, but uh, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham's famous answer is actually uh, kind of uh, slippery. He says, God will provide for himself the sacrifice, will provide for himself the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. Now, you've got to remember that in biblical Hebrew, there is no punctuation. So is he saying, God will provide for himself the sacrifice, my son? Or does he mean, God will provide for himself the sacrifice, colon, my son? What? In which case, he's not lying at all to, to uh, I, I started to say to the kid, but I figured that would just confuse everybody later. <laughs> so he, you know, it, it's a fabulous, the, the wording is, is intricate, it's magnificent. And uh, they, they go up the hill, you know, and to the, the, uh, this place called Moriah. It'll be called Moriah at the end by Abraham. And uh, he, uh, he puts, uh, he arranges the wood and the fire. Uh, there's the fact that Isaac himself carries the wood on which he's going to be sacrificed. And you can't be a Christian and miss that. That, 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 that Christ, I mean, to, to me, the most profound it really, it's uh, image of Christianity is not the crucifixion. It's that Jesus carries his own cross up the hill. Don't you, it, it makes you kind of wonder, why doesn't he just throw the darn thing down? And, and, they, and what are they going to do to make him pick him up? Pick it up, kill him? I mean, he, he, but, he, but he does. It, it's this image that, that he is a man who does not resist. So here's Isaac carrying the wood himself, which uh, has obvious meaning to a Christian and very little meaning to a Jew. And um, Abraham puts uh, Isaac, he, he arranges the wood, and he, he's got the fire, and he puts Isaac on the altar, and uh, he's got the knife in his hand over Isaac, and the angel of the Lord calls out to him and says, don't do it. You know, Abraham, can't you, not, can't you tell when I'm joking? You know, I'm, you're not really supposed to. And he says, don't do it. And, uh, and Abraham um, uh, instead finds a, 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 a goat kid, uh, I mean, a, a ram, rather, and, and uh, so it's a grown-up goat, goat, and uh, he sacrifices that in, in place of his son. And uh, then it says he goes back to the boys. Okay, that's the sacrifice of Isaac's story. We're going to leave it and come back to it. I just wanted to make sure we all have that story in mind first. Now, this comes up again in the next book of the Bible, in Exodus 24. Now you might say, no, this comes up in the story of where Moses and Aaron and Nadav and Abihu and Sethan the elders go up the mountain and on Sinai they have a, a, a revelation of God. It is the greatest revelation of the Bible to a, a full group of people. I mean, the, the big thing when all the people are there at the foot of the mountain, 
is the greatest revelation to a giant mass. But this is where all of these people, the 70 elders, and Abraham, and, and Moses, Aaron, and not Avinavi, who's the 74 people, all experience the same vision. They all go there and they have a vision, and it's that God is enthroned above them, and they can see, it's like in a Hitchcock movie, they can see like under the, the throne, the feet of God enthroned, and the floor is made of, it says some kind of jewel, sapphire or something. So it's like bricks of sapphire, so that they can see it, but you know, through a glass darkly, you might say. They, 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 they get an unclear image of what that is, but that's the closest anybody gets to seeing God. And remember, it is not that they're seeing God, God's self. It is a vision that they are having. A vision is not the same thing. You have a vision of God that's not the same as if the door opens, God walks in the room and says, sit down, Friedman, I'll take it from here. It's, <laughs> there's a big difference between those two. And uh, so they all have the same vision, which is God up there, seated above them, enthroned in the heavens. And uh, this is a very curious experience they have. Now, the amazing thing about this uh, Exodus 24 experience it's not only, you know, it's very impressive in itself, and we don't usually make a big deal of it. In Sunday school, we never teach it to the kids. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, when it comes up in the Torah parasha once a year, <laughs> the, uh, the rabbi will usually talk about something else from that parasha, not from this particular uh, episode. And I want to say that it is one of the most important episodes in the Torah and has never been properly Respect it for what it means. So, first of all, a few hints. Moses uh, says to the elders, sit here and we'll come back to you. And then, he, right, the 70 elders are there and he and the other, Aaron and the other, they go up higher on the mountain. And he says, sit here and we'll come back to you. You go, wait a minute. Those are the words that Abraham said to the serving boys in Genesis 22. And indeed, this Exodus 34 story of Moses and the elders and all on the mountain has servant boys also, Na'arim, in both stories. And both of them, it says, he sees the place from a distance. Hebrew, Merachot, same word. Both have this word, to bow, Lehishtachavot, in the stories. Both have a burnt offering, an Allah, which in the Isaac case is Isaac. And in the Moses case, is an animal. Both Moses and Abraham come up a mountain in the story. And if that isn't enough, those what I just give you. One, two, three, four, five, five items of parallel between the two stories. There's a chain, would, would 10 more do it? There's a chain of 10 verbs that occur in both stories. Uh, and he said, and he took, and he set, and he got up early, and he built an altar, and he put out his hand, and he or it was, and he or they got up, and he or they came, and he or they saw. Now, wait a minute. What's going on here? Ten verbs in common plus six other elements. At the end of the Isaac Abraham story, Abraham is rewarded, it says, God says, because you did this thing. The people in Exodus promised that we'll do all the things. Abraham is rewarded because, quote, you listened to my voice. The people in Exodus, it says, said with one voice, and they said, we'll listen. Now, that's a total of 18 parallels between the two, and it's, each one is only a chapter long. Uh, we're, we're way past coincidence here. Now, what should we do with that? Um, I'm in the unusual position of having written two commentaries on the Torah. Some of you know that. One of them is the Bible with Sources Revealed, which is a critical commentary, which shows the different sources and the different colors and all of that, J and D and P. And the other one is a traditional commentary, where I don't do any of that stuff about the different authors or any of that, but just give the kind of commentary that Rashi would have given if he had lived, you know, to the 21st century. And, and I'm saying that with a certain... I understand I should be, at least an ounce of humility here would be helpful, uh, that uh, uh, there, there's a, a novel by um, Chaim Potak, a blessed memory who I knew, and his book In the Beginning is about a young Jewish guy who wants to become a Bible scholar. 
interesting. And, and his wise old grandfather says to him, watch out. You start out wanting to be a new Rashi, you end up wanting to be a new Moses. And I've always kept that sort of like in front, like I should have it on my mirror when I shave so that I, I should never, you know, forget that. Keep, keep, keep the, the ego under control. So first of all, in the commentary I did on the different sources, the interesting thing is Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac story, and Exodus 24, the Moses on Sinai story, are both attributed to the source that we call E. That is, it is a further confirmation that we're right about the different sources and which is which. Like often I'll do something, I'll make something like green or blue in the book. People say, well, how did you know that, that that's E? How do you know that that's not J or P or something? Well, here, when you've got 18 things in parallel between two stories, and there are other connections between that and the different sources and authors, you're, oh, okay, that's pretty good. So on the one hand, it's good in a critical way for helping to confirm the, the, the documentary hypothesis. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Um, that it connects back to the story of Genesis 22 is a meaningful fact. And we should say, well, well what does that mean? What's the connection between Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son and Moses and the Israelites being up uh, on Mount Sinai? And part of it is that this fits with a certain possibility that I raised and that I deliberately didn't mention until now, which is the possibility that Abraham in the original story really did sacrifice Isaac. So this is something that came out partly when we got interested in the documentary hypothesis and looked at the different sources, but also it's something we, that some people knew as far back as the rabbis of the Midrash. That there was the possibility that in the original story, Abraham sacrifices Isaac. And you're, what are you talking about? The angel calls out and says, don't do it. And he doesn't do it. And uh, here are the problems. Those of you who know the, the basic part of the documentary hypothesis, know that the original clue that started people off, it's only one now out of a thousand, but originally it was the, the big clue, was there are whole sections, especially in Genesis, where, where God is only referred to as God, Hebrew Elohim. So that's why that's, you know, there's a source called the E source, where God is always referred to as Elohim. Because as you know, they spoke and wrote English in biblical times, so they used the letter E. It's, it's not the Aleph source for Elohim, it's the E source. And, uh, and the other source is the, there's another set where sometimes for whole chapters, God is always referred to by his name, Yahweh. So it's called the J source, and you go, but it's not Yahweh, it's Yahweh. Like it was German scholars who first thought of this, and in German, you know, there's no Y, it's a J that's pronounced Y. Yeah. And uh, so we're stuck with that forever. It's, uh, you know, in biblical scholarship, you all have to learn German. It's just, it, it's crucial, all the students learn it. And uh, we, we always say that German is the second most important Semitic language in, in uh, the Bible. And uh, in this story, you look at it and you go, you look at the text in Genesis 22, which I just happen to have here. And uh, it says, after these things, Elohim tested Abraham. So you got it? E, Elohim, God tested Abraham. And, um, it's, and uh, Abraham got up and he went to go to the mountain. And in verse uh, three, it says, and he went to the place that Elohim had told him, that God had told him. And um, he went with the boy, and when the boy says to him, well, here's the, the wood and the fire, but, but where's the, the, uh, the, 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 the sheep for the offering, the lamb? And God says to Abraham, Elohim will provide the lamb. And then the next verse nine is, and they came to the place that Elohim had told him. So do you get it? Elohim, 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 Elohim. It's the E source. God is never referred to by name. And then he ties up Isaac and he puts him on the altar. And he's got his hand in the air. And verse 11, it says, and the angel of Yahweh called him from the, to him from the sky and he said, Abraham, and he tells him, don't do it. And then he looks behind him and he sees this ram and he sacrifices the ram instead, okay? And then he names the place Moriah, Yahweh, Yireh, because Yahweh appeared there, so he even names it that. When he's not supposed to even know the name Yahweh, yet it's not supposed to be revealed till the time of Moses in this source. And then in, the, in verse 16, Yahweh um, speaks again, 
even though no, nobody, Abraham hasn't spoken in between. And what does he say? Because you did this thing, and you did not withhold your son, your only son, therefore I will greatly multiply you and bless your seed. Now, we've always understood that when he said, when God says you didn't withhold your son, we meant you were willing. But now it looks a little different. It's right in the verses where the name of God has changed that he doesn't do it. But in the original text without those verses, if you agree for a moment, just, to, uh, just be open to the hypothesis, that the verses were added and that in the original version, Isaac was sacrificed, and then in a later period, when the Jews no longer approved of, of human sacrifice, somebody said, whoa, this is no good, and he went back and, and, and fixed it. Now, what's the other evidence for this? The angel's instructions not to do it begin with, the, 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 and the angel of Yahweh said, and at the end it's God, you know, Yahweh says again, when you do that, where you have a repetitive resumption of a story. It's like, um, I think I've used the example before, if you're telling a joke and you blow the joke because you're halfway through it and you realize you left something out and you know, yeah. And so he says, wait, I, I forgot to mention, they're standing in front of the Empire State Building. And then he says, and you know, so that's called a repetitive resumption where you picked up the last sentence where you left off before the insertion. And that's what you have here. And that's called a repetitive resumption. There's actually a real word in English for it. It's called an epanalepsis, which sounds much more scholarly than saying it's a repetitive resumption. So we'll all agree. It's an epanalepsis. You can all impress your friends over dinner. You know, it's, it, it's an epanalepsis. Or if you really got, want to get impressive, because it's Bible scholarship, we're supposed to say it in German. So this is called a Wiederaufnahme. So God uses an, a Wiederaufnahme to tell Abraham not to do it. And then it goes back to the text and resumes the word where, where the section where Abraham was about to, uh, to do it. And then there's the fact that the angel said, because you did this thing and you didn't withhold your son, which I admit could mean you were willing, but now it's more suspect. And then it says, and Abraham went back to his boys. Where's Isaac? The last sentence of the story is Abraham went back to the boys. You might say, oh, that doesn't mean anything after all. He went, so we assume, of course, Isaac went back with him. And you go, well, I don't know, because at the beginning it had gone out of its way for Abraham to say to the boys, you wait here with the ass and we will return to you. And now it just has Abraham alone returning uh, to the boys. Also, in this E source, you can go on then through the, 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 the Torah. E is yellow in my books. You just keep going through, looking for the yellow and all that. You will find that Isaac never appears again in the story after this. He's not with us anymore. If you want a little more to this, there's actually several midrashim that were collected in, in rabbinic literature. So it's, 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 it's post all this. And the rabbis who wrote those midrashim, of course, they thought the Torah was all by by, uh, you know, one, if I was God to Moses. And yet there are several midrashim, they're collected uh, in a book called The Last Trial by Shalom Spiegel, who was a very fine rabbinic scholar. And he collected a group of midrashim where Abraham really sacrifices Isaac. And you go, but wait a minute, the, the angel in the story said, don't put a hand on the boy. And in those midrashim, it says, yeah, don't put a hand on the boy. But he'd already put Isaac on the wood and he'd already set the fire. So in those midrashim, Isaac dies in the fire. And then you go, but wait a minute. But in those stories, they're reading other sources, and Isaac is there later in the story. How did they account for that? It's that Isaac was really sacrificed, and he went to heaven for several years and studied Torah, and then was resurrected and came back. Now, you can see why Jews in that period were not really big on these midrashim. They did not survive as famous ones, because this is just when Christianity was being born, too. And so on the one hand, these rabbis who, who devised these midrashim may have been saying, oh, you have a resurrection, no big deal, we can do that too. And they had a resurrection of Isaac, or it could be the Jews didn't want to hear resurrection stories because they were rejecting that concept in Christianity, so they didn't want to say, oh yeah, no, no, no wrong. And so it's a very little known midrash, but, but there's more than one of them where it has that, that uh, Isaac dies on the fire, studies Torah in heaven for several years, and then gets resurrected and he's back. You know? 
Now, why would rabbis make up a darn thing like that? And one of the reasons we think is they saw these various problems in the text and this notion that in the original Abraham really had sacrificed Isaac may have always been floating around. I admit we're talking about a thousand years here, but that may have always been floating around in the background. And I'm cautious about that because I'm not big on you know, oral things lasting a thousand years, but it's such a curious thing for them to make up. And then recently, so I always had this idea, and if you look in some of my early books, I had it just as a footnote. I didn't want to make a big deal of it. It's in Who Wrote the Bible as a footnote someplace. But, uh, but I was always aware of it, this possibility that in the original, Abraham really sacrifices Isaac. But then I landed on this other thing I was talking about today, which is there are all those parallels, the 18 parallels between Exodus 24, the, the Sinai thing, and Genesis 22, the Isaac thing. And guess what? None of the 18 parallel things occurs in those words, the unit where the angel calls out to him and for four verses tells him not to do it, which is further evidence that that got added later. So um, yeah, it's quite possible that the original was that he did it. And you say, but why would they have a story that Abraham actually did sacrifice his son? And, and the fact is there's you know, a lot of research and scholarship now about uh, human sacrifice. I think I've talked to you in some past lectures or other that, um, that there's no human sacrifice in the ancient Near East, no known cases at all. The only human sacrifice where we actually have you know, physical evidence archeologically is uh, the Phoenicians did human sacrifice, but not in Phoenicia. Phoenicia was what is today Lebanon, but they had colonies, they were seagoing, and they had colonies all around the Mediterranean. And in their colonies, they did do human sacrifice. So in Carthage, there's very definite evidence a child sacrifice by the Phoenicians. But there's no evidence of Canaanites, Assyrians, Babylonians, uh, Aramaeans, Moabites, Edomites, none of them did human sacrifice. The only ones who, who we have evidence of sacrifice is the Jews. Because in the Bible, you know, there's references explicitly, uh, the prophets criticize the people for doing human sacrifice in the valley of ben Hinnom in Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and, and two kings of Israel and Judah are accused explicitly in the Bible. It's reported that they, they killed their children as sacrifices. So apparently it was something that early in the history of Israel, Jews did it. Now that may be upsetting to you, it's upsetting to me, but it's, they apparently did this thing. And then later when they rejected it, I mean, imagine the guilt and the shame that our ancestors did this thing. So we, we took the Abraham story and we cut that out. And we, and we said, no, it's a terrible thing. And especially in the prophet Jeremiah, so now you're down to the seventh century BCE, Jeremiah is powerfully criticizing the Jews of his time and the kings of, of, of sacrificing their children, considering that like a terrible sin. You can find these passages in Jeremiah where he's saying, we don't do that anymore. And so uh, the Jews are particularly strong against human sacrifice in the Torah, even though none of their neighbors were doing it. It was, uh, we, we pinned it on our neighbors. Oh yeah, those Canaanites, they were terrible. They used to sacrifice their kids. But there's no evidence that they ever really did it. It's not in their texts. It's not in the archeology. span So there you go. The only cases we have is, is us and, and we reject it. Now I'm proud to say we're, we're ashamed we ever did it. But um, the Abraham story had to get rewritten, and so it did. A few stories of my life and how I treated my children right, kind of like somebody to fix it too. You know? <laughs> I didn't holler at her that day. No, I would never holler at a child. <laughs> now let's try some other connections though. What is the point of making connections between Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac's story and Moses on Sinai? If that was done by the same author doing that, what is the significance of it? Why would somebody want to make 18 connections so we wouldn't miss it, even though somehow we managed to miss it for over 2,000 years? Why do they want to do that with all the, the 18 uh, connections? It seems to me there's a few connections we can make that are meaningful. One is a big doctrine among the rabbis was the merit of the fathers. In Hebrew, it's called the zechut avot, the, the merit of the patriarchs. And that because of the good things that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob did, their descendants would later have merit from it. So like when, when God wants to destroy the people at the, because of the golden calf episode, 
Moses uses a lot of arguments on God not to do it, but one of them is, remember your an our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and your promise to them. And when God wants to uh, get rid of the people again after the spies episode in the book of Numbers, he says, these people are terrible. They keep rejecting me. I'm going to destroy them and start over with you. And Moses, again, he says, no, 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 wait. You made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the merit of the fathers is considered something that is protective of the Jews for all time ever after. And uh, here's your first great case of it, that because Abraham in this story is willing to sacrifice his son, the, the, the greatest act of obedience in Genesis, the result is that later that saves the Jews during various other episodes in their lives when they, when they didn't necessarily have the merit or deserve to be saved, but they were because of the, the great deeds of their ancestors. So uh, I don't think the rabbis just made up the merit of the father's doctrine. I, I think it's there. It's just plain there in the text. Second is uh, Abraham's obedience there in Genesis becomes an example for the people to emulate. Um, that, that God tells Abraham, God, God says, I have chosen Abraham because then he will teach it to his children that they will all, to, and he would, they would learn justice and all after that. So that the Abraham's obedience becomes, he becomes a model for all of us of how we should behave which is not just obedience. Uh, I mean, he's always, everybody always talks about Abraham as the, as the model of the man of faith, but you, you notice that Abraham isn't a particularly a man of faith. There's just once in, in Genesis 15, he says, and he believed God. And you're, okay, but that's the only occurrence of the word emunah for uh, faith. The, the mark of Abraham is really obedience. He's a guy who will do whatever God tells. Jump, Abraham, oh, yes, sir. How high, sir? Can I come down yet, sir? Abraham is a man, kill your kid. Okay, I'll do that. You know, move, leave your land and go to a new land. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, he, he is the founder, and, and he sets uh, the example. Uh, another connection I would make between the two is, after all, it's, it's connecting the two sacred mountains of the Bible. It's, right? It's, it's, it, where is it that Abraham sacrifices Isaac? It doesn't say the name of the mountain, but uh, in the book of Chronicles, it, it is. It's referred to, you know, he, he called it the land of Moriah, and in the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles, it says, Moriah is the mountain where the temple is built. So if that's right, then it's making a connection between the mountain of the sacrifice of Isaac and the mountain of the temple. So, you know, yeah. And um, the, uh, the mountain of uh, the sacrifice of Isaac is referred to as the mountain of Yahweh, where the temple is. And the mountain in Exodus 24 uh, Sinai, where the, the uh, Moses and the elders and all are, is referred to as the mountain of God. So one is the Har Yahweh and one is the Har Elohim, but they're both connected to each other. So you got all these parallels. You can also think of the contrasts. Abraham in Genesis 22 is the ultimate case of obedience in the Bible. It's hard to think of a, a bigger act of obedience than you're at you to sacrifice your child when you do it. But Exodus 24 then when Moses comes back down and sees the people and all, what's going on? The golden calf, which is the greatest act of disobedience in the Bible. And those two become connected. Now, what should we do with that? Uh, literary study of the Bible sort of gotten into style, especially since the late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, which but as it happens is precisely, precisely the year I started out in the field. I came to San Diego for my first job at the University of California in 1976, and that was the year the books were coming out, like Bob Alter and others, people who weren't Bible scholars, but were literary scholars, and they started all getting into doing Bible study. And uh, most of us who do literary study of the Bible uh, attribute the beginning of that study, actually earlier, to a book by Erich Auerbach, who was a great uh, literary scholar, Jewish, in Europe, and uh, it wasn't specifically Bible, but he wrote uh, the book Mimesis, which is a classic of literary criticism. And in each chapter, he takes some other classic work of literature and says something brilliant about it. And apparently it was because he was a Jew and he had to get away from the Nazis. So he's, he's living in Turkey and he doesn't have his library with him. So he's just, you know, like from memory, <laughs> uh, writing about all the great works of literature and saying something good about it. So, you know, just, it's, it's sort of, like us now, 
we're all in the house trying to figure out what to do with our time because we can't get out there. You like, you like to just make us relevant? Are we all cool on that? Dan's years from now, people are going to watch these, you know, these, these lectures. They don't know what, what was he talking about? Well, there was a thing and they couldn't go outside. So Auerbach wrote the first chapter of that book, Mimesis, is called Odysseus Scar, where he compares the story of Isaac in Genesis with the story of Odysseus when he returns from the Trojan War in Homer. And he, and he used those two to show two different ways of telling a story. That the way that the Jews told the stories in the Bible was different, I mean, conceptually different, big time different, from the way the Greeks, meaning especially Homer, uh, would, would tell a story in uh, the epics. So, and the way he did it was he, sh he took the, the, Iliad and the Odyssey, and he said, the thing about the, the Greek way of telling a story is everything is in the foreground. Everything's in your face. If you need something for the story, you get it right away. And his classic case of that was the story of Odysseus' scar. And Odysseus, you know, he's, he went uh, with uh, the Greeks to uh, uh, Troy, and they were there for 10 years fighting the battle. And then he's 10 years, that's the Iliad, and then 10 years more on the road back. So he's been gone for 20 years, that's the Odyssey. And then he finally makes it back. And he's all bearded and different and kind of scraggly from the trip and uh, keeps himself disguised. So nobody recognizes him except the dog. Even, even his wife Penelope does not recognize him. But there's a way that recognition happens and it becomes because of a scar that he has on his leg and there's this old woman who worked at, in his house since he was a child. And she starts washing him up, washing his leg. And um, she sees the scar on his leg. Now watch what's going to happen. Bing! Flashback. It's going to give you the whole story of how he got the scar on his leg. And then bing! Foot, it'll take you back in time to the old lady seeing the scar. Now watch how this goes. And you, see, and you'll, and you can't think of any Bible story that works like this. So he spoke, and the old woman took up the shining basin she used for foot washing and poured in a great deal of water, the cold first, and then she added the hot. Now Odysseus was sitting close to the fire, but suddenly turned to the dark side. That doesn't mean what we mean now, but turned to the dark side. For presently he thought in his heart that as she handled him, she might be aware of his scar and all his story might come out. She came up close and washed her lord, and at once she recognized that scar, which once the boar with his white tusk had inflicted on him when he went to Parnassos to Autolycus and his children. This was his mother's noble father, who does his grandfather, who surpassed all men in thievery and the art of the oath. We have somebody like that now. And the god Hermes himself had endowed him, for he had pleased him by burning the thigh bones of lambs and kids, and the gods freely gave his favor. This was why Odysseus came, so that he would give him glorious presents. Autolycus and the sons of Autolycus greeted him with clasping of hands and words of endearment, and Amphithea, his mother's mother, embraced Odysseus and kissed his head, and kissed too his beautiful, shining eyes. But when the young dawn showed again with the rosy fingers, they went out on their way to the hunt, the dogs and the people. Mm -hmm. The hunters came to the wooded valley, I'm skipping parts because it's long. The hunters came to a wooded valley, and on ahead of them ran the dogs, casting about for the tracks, and behind them the sons of Autolycus, and with them noble Odysseus went close behind the hounds, shaking his spear far shadowing. Now there, inside that thick of the bush, was the lair of a great boar. Neither could the force of, of, of wet-blown winds penetrate here, nor could the shining sun ever strike through with his rays, nor yet could the rain pass all the way through it. So close together it grew with a fall of leaves drifted in dense profusion. The thudding made by the feet of men and dogs came to him as they closed on him in the hunt, and against them he from his wood lair bristled strongly his nape, and with fire from his eyes glaring stood up to face them close. The first of all was Odysseus, who swept in holding high in his heavy hand the long spear, and furious to stab, but too quick for him, the boar drove over the knee and with his tusk gashed much of the flesh tearing sideways and did not reach the bone of the man. 
Now Odysseus stabbed at him, hit him in the right shoulder, and straight on through him, past the point of the shining spearhead. He screamed and dropped in the dust, and the life flitted from him. The dear sons of Autolycus were busy to tend him, and understandingly they bound up the wound of stately godlike Odysseus, and singing incantations over it stayed the black blood, and soon came back to the house of their loving father. Then Autolycus and the sons of Autolycus, healing him well and giving him shining presents, and sent him speedily back, rejoicing to his own beloved country in Ithaca. And there his father and queenly mother were glad in his homecoming, and asked about all that had happened, and how he came by his wound. And he told well his story, how in the hunt the boar with his white tusk had wounded him, as he went up Parnassos with the sons of Autolycus. The old woman, holding him in the palm of her hands, recognized this scar as she handled it. She let his foot go so that his leg, which was in the basin, fell free, and the bronze echoed. The basin tipped over on one side and the water spilled out on the floor. Pain and joy seized her at once and both eyes filled with tears and the springing voice was held within her. She took the beard of Odysseus in her hands and spoke to him. Then, dear child, you are really Odysseus. Now, when, when you were there with that, him getting the, the wound and all, suddenly you had bounced back in time and we were there in our setting, completely forgetting about the old woman and the washing and the, all, the, all of everything that you've been reading through this whole story of his journey back for 10 years. And you're there. And then, boom, you're back and you're there. And um, Auerbach said that was the Homeric way to tell a story. Everything has to be in the foreground. He said, the Bible's way is the exact opposite. Everything is rich in background, he said. When you see Abraham and Isaac going up this mountain to perform this awful sacrifice, you've got to think back and go, no, no, now wait a minute. God made promises to Abraham of things that were going to happen through Isaac. What, 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 what are we doing with that? And then you have to go back, oh, Abraham and he married Sarah, and that's how they had Isaac. Oh, and it took them a long time to get to Isaac. They had Ishmael and Hagar and everything first. And then you go, oh, and all of this, who is promising this? It's God. It's God who created the heavens and the earth, and then got Adam and Eve, and you got no one. You, you've got all of that matters to get us to this point where he's with the boy. But it never flashes back to him saying, yes, and so he, he was going to sacrifice his son to the God who brought the flood. I mean, they, they don't do that and bounce back and tell the story of the flood there. It's right where it belongs. Now, that was considered one of the great founding works of um, literary study of the Bible. That, um, that are, the Bible stories are rich in background. But to put it more specifically, you could say the Sinai revelation takes place because the Moriah revelation took place. Or you could say without Moriah, there would be no Sinai. And you can say the story points to the future the event on Sinai is the beginning of the fulfillment of what is promised back at Moriah, namely that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your seed. So, so that's great. It doesn't mean Jewish is better or worse than Greek. Those are just two ways of telling a story. They're both terrific. And, uh, but you should be aware that this is the Bible's way of telling a story. And it's never going to be forgotten when you get to Moses, this Abraham stuff is going to count. And when you get to King David, and when you get down to Queen Esther, it, ne it never goes away. The story keeps getting richer and richer. And we usually miss that because most of us don't study the Bible in order. Even if you go to the Torah reading in the synagogue every week, it's still spread out, so they're a week apart, and the rabbi picks out only a part of it to talk about. It's very hard to read through the whole thing, get a sense of the flow of the whole Bible. But it really is there, and it works. And it's an exceedingly rich way of telling a story. And uh, here it is. So maybe he sacrificed Isaac, really, maybe he didn't. But either way, it made all the difference in the world for everything that happened after. <laughs>